Hello everyone and welcome to ICMDA webinar. Buenos días a todos, bienvenidos a los Saunders, the ICMDA, the International Christian Medical and Dental Association. And today we're privileged to have Dr. Perry Jansen to address the subject of systems thinking for mission hospitals. So uh, welcome Perry, uh, it's great to have you uh, on the program. Uh, mission, uh, what systems thinking? Well, mission hospitals operate in some of the most challenging environments in the world and sustaining health services in a way that maintains quality while at the same time honoring God's call to serve the poor can seem sometimes unattainable. In the past, we've had ICMDA webinars covering tools and approaches for managing mission hospitals, but in this session, we're going to take a 30,000 foot view of the complex and dynamic environments we operate on and how we can apply the science of systems thinking to improve strategies and impact. Uh, Perry Jansen is a family physician. He served with SIM in Malawi from 2000 to 2016. He founded the Malawi nonprofit hospital Partners in Hope, which has grown to be one of the largest providers of HIV treatment in the region as a key training partner with the Ministry of Health and USAID. And after realizing his goal of, of handing Partners in Hope over to Malawi and leadership, Dr. Jansen attained his MPH with an emphasis on global health leadership. <clears throat> He's now Vice President at Africa Mission Healthcare, leading initiatives to strengthen mission hospitals to expand medical education and strengthen indigenous healthcare leadership. So Perry, it's a, it's a great privilege to have you today and we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Over to you, thanks. Well, thanks, Peter. Uh, I'm very excited to be here and I'm also so appreciative of the work that ICMDA has come has done to put together these um, webinars. And, and we were talking this morning, I think there's about 115 webinars in the library. So if you haven't done much of these, go to the go to the ICMDA website and look at their webinars. Um, they've got a whole bunch of really great webinars. Um, as Peter said, uh, I, I began my work in missions in Malawi, Africa in, in 2000, really at the peak of the HIV AIDS epidemic. And really that was my initial calling was really to respond to the AIDS epidemic there. And during that time, though, um, we were able to found a, a hospital or a medical center that became a hospital and now has expanded to a nonprofit organization that works throughout the whole country doing capacity building uh, for HIV. And my, my uh, passion really expanded from caring for HIV patients to looking at health systems, recognizing, in a sense, I was the beneficiary of uh, a mechanism of silo funding that I think causes problems within health systems when one disease or one issue gets all the funding and others are neglected. Um, and so my, my current passion is really still in Africa and still in HIV, but also in, in health systems strengthening. Um, these are the countries that AMH is primarily focused on. And my role is working with uh, teaching hospitals within these sites to help strengthen them as organizations and help to launch new teaching programs and strengthen existing teaching programs. Uh, I kind of think of this as an extension of some of the other webinars that, that are on in the library. Uh, Dave Stevens gave a great seminar talking about uh, leadership and governance uh, within mission hospitals. Rick talked about some of the challenges and opportunities within uh, mission hospitals. And uh, Doug Fountain from CCIH, another great organization, um, gave a talk on health systems more broadly. Uh, we got a specific example from Keir Thielander about uh, training programs uh, that help to strengthen uh, surgical services. And just like in the physical world, we have tools for examining our environment. You know, we have we have an electron microscope where we can look at the details of the coronavirus. <laughs> we have the new James Webb uh, telescope that looks at galaxies. Um, this talk is really probably in between those two, you know, as I said, a 30,000 foot view, um, not looking in great detail in specifics, 
but hopefully giving you some practical tools uh, for the environments that you guys are working in. Um, I think many of you are familiar with this, this story of the blind men and the elephant, where these men, they, this shows blindfolded uh, uh, men, but the original story is blind men looking at an elephant and trying to figure out what is the nature of this creature that they're that they're exploring? The guy up on top is feeling the the ear, the big broad ear that moves back and forth, and and thinks, well, this is much like a fan. Uh, the person uh, down at the leg is feeling this heavy trunk, thinks this is like a great tree. The person at the trunk is feeling this snake-like uh, structure and thinks it's like a a big heavy snake. The man at the tusk feels it smooth and sharp. It must be like a sword. So each of these observations are accurate really from their perspective, but none of them by themselves give you a picture of what the nature is of this uh, creature that they're exploring. In the same ways, you know, many times we have, uh, our, our thinking is very narrow and very focused on our own perspective. Uh, our, our brains were built, were designed uh, for looking for cause and effect relationships. So um, very, I can imagine the early hunter gatherers, you know, they would be picking berries, you know, say, well, they're hungry, they're gonna try this berry, that berry makes them sick. So they, they say, I'm, we shouldn't eat this berry. And they tell all the people, those berries are poisonous, you need to stay away. And, and this, this cause and effect is really one of our primary <laughs> mechanisms for survival especially in a dangerous world, we need to look for causation. However, in, in complex systems, like the systems that we often work in, uh, cause and effect are not always that clear and that obvious. And usually they're impacted by many other factors that are also constantly in flux. And so that's the difference really between linear thinking and systems thinking. Um, if we think about, uh, um, the, our uh, first understanding of malaria, for, for instance, was thinking, well, uh, you people who live near swamps, they get malaria. And so it must be the swamp gases. When in actuality, it's a much more complex uh, environment. The swamp is, is breeding grounds for mosquitoes, and mosquitoes are the host for the malaria parasite. And so many, many things that we deal with are, are much more complicated. Um, and have to be thought of in different ways. Um, difference between linear thinking and systems thinking, one related to cause is that there's a direct connection between this action and that this cause and that uh, result, where in, in systems really the, the uh, performance of the system is really due to much more complex interdependencies between different aspects of that system. Um, in terms of time, uh, one of the errors that, that are often made is that we make short-term decisions that help us for the moment, but in the long term uh, can, can actually cause failure. And we know in systems thinking that quick fixes often actually make the problem worse. Uh, in linear thinking, responsibility is often thought of as some sort of external thing that's acting upon the situation that's out of our control. System thinking, we realize that even our own efforts may be unwittingly contributing to the problem, or at least that it's very complex to say, well, what is the cause of this problem? Um, in linear thinking, we think, well, if we fix this one part, it's going to help the whole. And that's such a common thing. Uh, rather than understanding uh, that the whole is so dependent upon many different factors and that what we want to find are some key leverage points, some things that we can change that will that will change the whole system. Uh, this is a, a map. I'm not, I, it's it almost intentionally blurry because it, the details aren't important, but this is really a map of all of the things that are contributing to uh, uh, the health of someone with diabetes, you know, related to their diet, their diet and their environment and the healthcare setting, a uh, very complex set of interrelated factors. Each mission hospital really is a part of its own little micro system that includes maybe some supporting churches, some international organizations, sending organizations, donors, 
universities and other partners. And even beyond this is connected to governments and, and, and global health things. So mission hospitals are definitely part of large interconnected complex systems. I gave a talk uh, a number of years ago at the CMDA MedCEN conference, and I used this tool to map out the relationships that I knew because of my connection with MedCEN, the relationships that I knew that these sending organizations, and you can hardly even see them in here, but this would be like, you know, frontiers or pioneers, you know, and how they're connected to one another and how they were connected to the hospitals in which we worked. And you can see this is like a complex jumble like spaghetti. <laughs> so how do you make sense of health systems? And that's where um, uh, complexity theory and systems thinking comes in to say, what are some tools that we can use so that we can understand systems better, understand how they work, and, and probably most importantly, how we can interact and move, the, move complex systems in directions that we want to move them. Um, early science actually came uh, from MIT and some of the early uh, system dynamics research came from uh, the development of military applications for tracking uh, moving objects with radar, tracking planes and stuff. So the, the plane in space or in the air is moving and changing directions and we need to actually track it. From that came really understandings of fluid dynamics and other uh, more physical types of uh, uh, mathematical uh, exploration of complex systems. Um, Jay Forrester was one of the first to apply this to human systems as he looked at urban, this, this, this very controversial uh, uh, article called Urban Dynamics where he looked at the, the things that actually contribute to poverty and a lot of the problems of urban setting and was one of the first people to identify that large low income housing uh, provision within uh, large cities actually contributed to poverty rather than providing what we would consider some sort of a, a, a fix for people who are poor. Um, and systems thinking at, in, as a discipline has really grown. And there are many people who have contributed to this. Um, these are just some of my favorite books. If you're interested, please reach out to me and I can I can give you my my little reading list of things I've read in, in systems thinking. Uh, and, I, and I hope this is interesting to you because it's interesting to me. I like to figure out puzzles. Um, Paul, in his books in the New, in the, uh, New Testament, recognized that the church is a complex system and, and uh, re recognize that we are all part of the body of Christ and that each part has its own role and we should recognize that what harms one part harms the other. So in a sense, we could say, you know, that, that system thinking is, is biblical, <laughs> but it's certainly not anti-biblical. As we look at the very basics of, of complex systems, one of the, one of the early uh, systems thinkers was Donella Meadows. And she basically, she, she broke it down to as simple components as you can so that we can understand this. But the, the, every system is composed of specific parts or elements. And these can be people or institutions, but they can also be less tangible things like, like stigma or fear or justice, uh, things that are um, you know, part of, of, a, uh, of a system and interrelate with other things. The second component of the system is the relationships between the elements. So it's not just about the elements themselves, but how they connect with one another and impact one another. And then thirdly, really, is, is broadly, what is the function? What is the purpose of this system? What is this system designed or what does this system accomplish, whether it's designed to do it or it does it just naturally? Um, an important concept within systems thinking is to realize that uh, we all develop mental models in our, in our minds. We develop mental pictures and stories that we tell ourselves about the real world. And, and ideally, we want our mental models to be an approximation of reality. Uh, these days, it seems maybe less so. <laughs> we don't want to see reality. Um, 
but it, but our our mental models actually help us interact with the world, predict the world, and even help to change things in the in the direction that we want them to change. Feedback from the real world then gives us uh, a better, more accurate. Hopefully, gives us a better, more accurate view of what the real world is. You know, a, a very simple example is a toddler who sees a fire and thinks it's very attractive and beautiful. But if they touch it, it's hot, gives them feedback to say, don't touch that thing, it's hot. <laughs> Most of the time, it's the mothers yelling and screaming at them that makes them not touch the fire. But in that very simple system, uh, that feedback loop helps that toddler have a more um, realistic, more, more accurate view of what fire is. Unfortunately, uh, most of our systems are not quite so simple, although there are things that are more simple than others, as we know. Um, so this is a um, uh, kin, this, it's, it's a funny spelling, it's, it's kin, kin Evan uh, framework developed by um, De, uh, Dan, Dave Snowden, um, looking at basically looking at different types of systems. There are some things that are very simple uh, and, and actually the fire would be a, an example. You, you sense this, you see the fire, you put it in the category based on previous experiences that this is hot and then you know how to respond, don't touch. Um, and in, in medicine and, and other things within, uh, within our uh, environment of healthcare, there are some things that fit into this category, but actually quite few. Um, and for th those things, you can develop what we would call best practices, where everybody knows this is the best thing to do for this particular thing. One of my favorite things to treat is a nursemaid's elbow, where, where there's a dislocation of the, the radius in a toddler from pulling on it. And you can pretty easily diagnose that even without an x-ray. Very, then they're very, very simple maneuver that puts it right back into place. And so I love getting those because people come in, oh, I think we, he's broken his arm and, and you just do a little quick thing and the baby feels better, everyone's happy. Very few things are like that, <laughs> but you sense it. And these are these, these are these descriptions that Snowden came up with. You sense it, you categorize it, and you know how to respond. Much of what we do is much more complicated, it requires some analysis and research. Uh, this is where clinical trials come in and, and, and other ways of, of doing research about either health systems or health problems. But research, knowledge, and, and expertise help you to make better decisions about um, how to handle this particular uh, situation that you're in. You sense it, you apply the analysis and the learning to it, and then you know how to respond. And you can come up with good practices. Good practice uh, really in, in, uh, in distinction from best practices, there may be many ways to do this. There's many ways to take out a gallbladder and there are some things not, wait, ways not to do it, but good practices uh, are come from experience and knowledge. Much of what we deal with in uh, health systems is, are complex, that these are um, situations where there are many things that are interacting and changing at the same time. And they're less amenable to doing a one, you know, you do one uh, clinical trial and now you know what to do. They really require this probing, sensing uh, um, uh, capacity. And that, that is really what we're talking about with feedback. Within complex systems, you need to have ways to probe what's actively happening now and sense it and then respond but also do so in a moving forward uh, basis so that as the system changes, you can actually change your practice. And we would call that maybe emergent practices. Chaos, uh, chaotic systems, I won't get too much into, but those ones you basically need to act and, and, and change continuously. And, and those would be considered novel, novel practices. Um, one example, uh, so our, our focus is really going to be on complex uh, systems. Let me see if I can play this here. Um, this, I don't know if people have seen these before. <laughs> this is a group of starlings that are all flying in formation. And, and it's very beautiful. And it's, they seem to move almost as one superorganism. And you think, well, is there some leader that's giving everyone instructions to say, okay, now turn left, turn right, 
or is there some sort of advanced plan, strategic plan that they're following is first we're gonna do this formation and then that formation. Uh, but uh, clearly that's not the case. And so scientists have studied these phenomena and have come up with actually some very simple rules for how starlings fly in these formations. Um, one of those rules, whoops, sorry, let me move, I'm trying to move to the next slide. Go here, there we go. One of, so one of those is to follow the bird that's in front of you um, and then maintain a distance from your closest neighbors. And they do this primarily by light. If it gets too dark, that means they're too dense. And so they move apart. If it's too, uh, if it's too light, they move together. If it's too dark, they move apart. And then to avoid obstacles. And those three uh, rules then uh, dictate each individual bird's actions, but all of the beauty that comes from the movement is really just random, very small chance changes and differences that happen um, that actually form what looks like it's a, a purposeful movement, uh, but it's really just a collective action of this uh, superorganism. I think some of us have been involved in this simple superorganism activity with the stadium wave. I don't know if people have done that, where you're in this big round stadium and, and everyone stands up in, in a certain pattern and the wave goes all the way around the arena. And there's some very simple rules. You stand up when the person to your right stands up and you raise your hands over your head and then you sit down. And th these are really fun uh, group activities to have. And it's really interesting that if you look between events and even regardless of stadium sizes, this is a human, kind of a human superorganism. And if you measure the velocity of the wave, one match versus another, it's almost identical. And those are related, I think, to our biological systems and our reflexes and our ability to interact. Um, but it's, it's sort of a fun example of, of a human organism. As we think about then the rules within complex systems and, and complex human systems, especially, um, there are ways that we can apply specific rules. Uh, Cabrera, there's a, a couple in, out of uh, Cornell, uh, the Cabreras who, put to, who have uh, come up with this framework for creating simple rules for looking at systems. They call it the DSRP model. So you have the rule, and then each rule has an element. Uh, for example, the distinction is that you identify these elements like, uh, like uh, Meadows had talked about. What are the elements within the systems? These can be an organization, a person, a department, but also these things like perception and uh, bias and all the other things that impact complex systems. And you basically, the, the distinction is that this is this, is this thing and then everything else is not this thing. So you have your mission hospital, and then you have all the other things that are connected to the mission hospital. Um, even, and then the second is system, recognizing that even within these specific parts, there are subsystems that you could say. So you can say, well, you've got the mission hospital as a whole, that's the second element, but then you have also the parts within this system that you have your HR department, your finance department, your clinical department. And even from there, you've got your clinical department that has your nurses and your, and your physicians and your uh, you know, other professionals that are there. So recognizing how to break all of those things up into, into systems. And then thirdly, R, R is relationships. How do these interact with each other? And the elements are an action and, and a reaction. So, you know, in a, in a mission hospital setting, you can say, well, the action is a policy from the HR department, but the reaction, hopefully not, <laughs> is a strike from the nurses. You know, you have these interactions that you can look at. And then lastly, it is perspective to recognize that from, uh, and and the, the, the distinctions are a point and a view. So I have my point, say I'm the CEO of the hospital. I, this is where I am and this is how I see things. But the view is, you know, uh, someone outside of me looking in at me saying, well, the CEO, he's the biggest part of the problem here at the hospital. And they see things completely different. So recognizing 
that within this system uh, that these distinct entities and relationships will all have their own unique perspectives. And it's a useful way of, of looking at things. Uh, another useful tool related to this is systems mapping. Um, the ideal way to do systems map is to include all of the people who know something about that system and are participants of that system. So this is where having community engagement and having a diversity within your team so that you can have various perspectives. Um, one of the most simple tools within systems mapping is the causal loop diagram. And, and loops are common, common themes within systems thinking, recognizing this is not linear, but it's circular and related to many other circles. This is a simple example of a restaurant um, and how the the how crowded the restaurant is affects your perception of the quality of the restaurant. A couple of years ago, we went into a restaurant that we'd never been into before because we were traveling and we went in there at a meal time and there was nobody there. <laughs> it was like six o'clock p.m. dinner time. There's no customers, but there were people behind and we didn't have time to find another restaurant. And we sat down and we had the food and then we discovered why then nobody comes there for dinner because it was terrible food. <laughs> On the other hand, we've probably all been seeing restaurants where it's like, wow, man, there's a whole bunch of people crowded at that restaurant. There's a big long line. There must be good food uh, at that restaurant. And so this, uh, the number of people who are seated and enjoying their food it leads to a perceived that there's a that, that this must be a good restaurant because there's a lot of customers and so it actually attracts additional customers and this is one loop and we call this a reinforcing loop uh there are different kinds of loops um let me go back to this uh loop. reinforcing loop so something that 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 has a positive effect where customers occupying table leads to more customers coming and so that's a positive reinforcing loop. The other kind of loop is called a balancing loop. And even though, you know, maybe balancing sounds like a positive thing, usually a balancing loop is something that returns you back to the steady state or what you had before. And some, in some ways undoes what you do, what you're trying to accomplish, that is getting more customers and more money. Um, if you have a lot of customers occupying tables, you're more likely to have a long queue for new customers arriving and therefore they may be hungry and they need to go, they go somewhere else because they don't have time to wait at your restaurant. And so that's considered a balancing uh, loop. Um, delays are important to remember that, uh, that say this, you know, having a lot of customers at the table, increased quality uh, takes a while before word gets out that this is a busy restaurant, we need to go to that. So recognizing as a leader that there are delays between your actions and the outcomes is an important part of, of systems thinking. Uh, good reputations take a while to build. We know that the delays in, if you serve terrible food, everyone gets E. coli, you're, that's going to be less of a delay in the word getting out. And so just recognizing in more complex situations than this, that, that sometimes there's a delay between your action and your desired uh, outcome that you're looking for. The most important aspect of systems mapping is together as a team, as a, as a group of people who are interested in solving whatever problem it is. You know, I think many of you are, are dealing with much more meaningful problems like uh, access to care and how to, how to serve the poor than this problem. But the key thing to mapping is to identify some leverage points to say, well, what we need to do is uh, if we can only impact the number of customers occupying these tables and say, you know, one, one technique would be that we always seat customers towards the front. So it looks like we're busy, but we have room in the back that we can seat other customers who come in if we get really busy and that we work with our kitchen to make sure you know service is is fast and and the food is good but these are leverage points that we can just realize that we don't there are some things that we don't have control like you know really the number of customers uh, but there are some things that we can control that that we can map out and say yeah if we could increase this then it would increase that and give us what we want 
um, that the, there, there have been many attempts really to map uh, a global health systems. And this is one that probably everyone is familiar with. And I don't mean this as a criticism because this is a very useful framework, I think, to look at health systems and what the components are. But if we think about this compared to the DSRP model, you know, we have our distinctions here uh, that are the, the, the kind of more the harder, more tangible distinctions. And then this is also, these are distinctions, these are outcomes, and then, and then some elements of healthcare. So, you know, this, this framework is, while it's useful in many ways, it doesn't capture all of the complex interactions between all of these things. How does, how does governance affect, you know, the information, the IT and research? Um, all of those things interact with one another. And, and it doesn't give us the ability to identify specific leverage points. And so um, this was just something I did by myself, just thinking through uh, for my job, teaching what, what are the things that impact teaching. And again, you probably can't read all of these things, but this is just my own thinking uh, using this software that I really like called Plectica. Um, that allows you to map the interactions between various aspects within a system. And now if I did that, sorry, if I did that map with PACs and with some mission hospitals and some mission leaders and, and some health uh, systems people, we'd come up with a bigger and more complicated map and probably be able to do a better job identifying, you know, what are the, the, the leverage we, we could implement. So systems mapping is a very useful tool to do, especially as a team, but even as an individual, it gives you a framework to look at specific problems that you may be dealing with. Um, with every culture has its own set of proverbs. These are you know, wise sayings, usually reflect the values of the culture and some of the history of the culture. And that's true really within this uh, health systems or uh, systems thinking culture. Um, one of the early uh, pioneers of quality assurance is uh, W. Edward Deming. And one of his famous sayings is slightly changed is every system is perfectly designed for the results that it's currently getting. And so in, in the context of quality improvement, it's important that we recognize that all of the specific experiences that our patients are having and the complications that we have within hospitals are really not due to just individual actions. They're due to systems things. And so rather than saying, well, we're going to punish the nurse for giving the wrong medicine, we need to recognize that there's a whole system behind the delivery of the nurse giving medications that we need to address to improve quality and reduce medication errors. Um, and that if we're getting bad results, we can't just blame it on one person. We have to say, yeah, this is the system that needs to be fixed. Um, there are many other proverbs from other people. Peter Senge is probably one of the most prolific authors in, in systems thinking. And uh, he has what he calls the 11 laws of systems thinking in his book called The Fifth Discipline. And we'll talk a little more about that later. Um, and so I'm not going to go through all of these. That could be one whole lecture. Um, but number one, law number one, just to sort of whet your appetite to look these up or to, to write me and I'll send them to you. Uh, but one of these laws is that today's problems come from yesterday's solutions. And so this is just a sort, you know, a short sort of easy to remember um, proverb recognizing when you're seeing a problem, you know, often it's going to say, well, what are, why are they doing things that way? And if you follow things back in history, you realize at some point back in time, they did this because there was this particular situation and this was a solution they thought at that time. And, and it may have backfired or it may no longer be appropriate. Um, but to recognize that within systems, everything is very related to what has come before. And so if you wanna try and interact with the system and change it, you have to really understand what are the roots of why this is the way that it is. Um, and so I would encourage you to, this is, if you're gonna get one book, it would be Peter Sen Senge, uh, The Fifth Discipline. Um, and, uh, and you can look at the other 11 laws, but they're all very profound. 
Um, similar to, to Proverbs, each culture has its own parables. You know, these are not just uh, sayings, but are more like stories that tell a story that's much greater and much more apl broadly applicable. And within, they call those within systems thinking, they call it systems archetype. And if you're a literary person, you know, there are archetypes within literature where a character is, you know, may have a specific name in this book, but he really represents a broad um, uh, number of recurring stories that happen in many cultures and in many times. Probably the most famous kinds of art archetypes are, are the villain and the and the heroes, you know, those are archetypes uh, that represent other things in, in the story. Um, one archetype that's just sort of humorous, it comes from Hans Christian Andersen, The Emperor's uh, New Clothes is the name of the book, where this proud emperor is tricked by these thieves into uh, buying some, uh, some clothing, having them make clothing that's the most magnificent clothing that any any king has ever had. And um, uh, they say that only people who are wise can see this clothing. And so they bring pretend to bring cloth to him and they show it to him. And he's too proud to say that he can't see them uh, and ends up parading through the city bare naked. And it's a child that points out. And that's a system archetype that really said is about speaking truth to power. Sorry, I'm running out of time here. So many different system archetypes I, I don't have time to go into. There are some, uh, and they're very useful because there are frameworks for looking at complex systems and applying these stories and quickly identifying, you know, what the problem is and, and what the solution might be. Um, it's important, as I said, to do this within an organization uh, to create sh uh, shared vision and shared mental models as a team. Very important as a part of that team then to have feedback mechanisms that give you information about uh, how you're doing and how you're impacting the world and having team learning. And then having a team understand the broader system in which they interact. Uh, another very important tool developed by the Cabrera team is this VMCL, vision, mission. We all have a vision statement and a mission statement. And, and then they go to the level of uh, understanding the capacity that's needed to execute first level capacities and second level capacities. And then the importance of, of um, having uh, institutional learning, having feedback mechanisms, not just a QA report that's for compliance, but a way for your team to get feedback. Uh, these days, uh, you know, leaders are really needing to recognize that they're dealing with complex systems and they need to, rather than just saying, hey, you, I'm the leader, you follow me, I'm going to tell you what to do. They can interact with their team, encourage everybody to understand the vision and where we're going. Another excellent book is Simon Sinek's Start With Why. A leader's job is really to, to point the way to say, hey, this is where why we're doing what we're doing, starting with why and then translating down to, to how and what. Um, missions hospitals, you know, some people would say, are, you know, these are relics from the past. I've heard that said before. Having visited many, many mission hospitals, I see that that's not true. They're actively involved in, in the Great Commission, the Greatest Commandment. We're modeling Christ's health ministry and the ministry of the apostles. And it's really the calling of the church to care for the poor and of the sick as a part of being members of, of God's kingdom. So that's our why. Um, the how is really caring for the poor, demonstrating word, we're in things, uh, demonstrating God's word, God's love and word and deed, and often minding the gaps within health systems and modeling whole person care. Uh, I think Christians have the best model of health as we understand that health is more than just an absence of disease, it's spiritual health and community health. There are many different forms that uh, healthcare missions can take and uh, we are, it's really more about our specific calling. Um, I think I'm gonna end there because my time is more than up and we'll take some time uh, for some questions.
Thanks very much, Perry. We've been listening to Perry Jansen uh, speaking to us on the subject of systems thinking for mission hospitals. I guess uh, you, you've raised so many issues and given us a huge number of different references and experts in this area, Perry, and I'm sure there are many people out there, well, we know there are people out there working in mission hospitals or managing mission hospitals and, and thinking, wow, this is all very complex and interesting and it's, this makes sense to me because many of the problems that we're facing don't seem to have easy solutions. Could, could you perhaps um, start off by giving us maybe an example or two from your own experience of a problem encountered in a mission hospital where a simple uh, linear approach did not work and where systems thinking helped the participants to, to find a solution that worked better? Yeah, I probably could. <laughs> I haven't had my second cup of coffee this morning. Um, you know, I think uh, probably one of the things that, I, that I'm dealing with with, with my own organization, um, there's a, there's a art system archetype called success to the successful. And uh, we had started a nonprofit organization that that uh, really started with grassroots and doing a lot of care of HIV patients, and we were recognized for our good care. And we started that doing capacity building within the whole country uh, with grants from USAID. And then it, it we've become actually quite a a, a prominent or uh, almost overutilized. <laughs> Uh, partner for USAID. Um, and I think those who get USAID grants know that if you've done large, managed large USAID grants, you have a lot of systems you put in place to be able to run that. And you're more, and you're more well connected to US government and you're more likely to get a new grant. And, and so you're kind of the first to the buffet table. And what can happen, and while that's nice in that you, you actually have to work less hard to be recognized, often you end up uh, being that put the negative aspect of success to the successful is that you, you stop being innovative and you stop really thinking about what are the needs that are going unmet. What you start focusing on is what are the things that our, gut, that our donor is looking for us to do and how do we do more of those so we can get more money. And, and that you, you stop being innovative and creative and you stop, sometimes you can even lose your way with, the mission, with, your, with your own mission. And that's another um, drifting, uh, drifting goals is another uh, systems archetype where you can say, well, we started out actually to serve the poor in our community, but now we're running a big NGO um, just running around busily trying to collect, uh, you know, outputs for our donor. And so applying, applying those, that systems understanding really helps make sure that you're staying on track that, you know, why it's good to be successful, you only need to make sure that you're also innovative. Um, so that's one high level um, application, I think. That, that's really helpful. And the whole issue of not not letting the priorities of the funder uh, distort and drive and misshape your own vision and mission and in, in what you're yeah. doing. Um, can you give us perhaps just to put a flesh on the bones a bit more, could you give us more of a kind of uh, clinical level example of, you know, and, and of, um, of where systems thinking has helped to solve a, a problem? that staff might be experiencing in running a mission hospital as opposed to management? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, within within clinical systems, one, one of the disciplines that, that we see in teaching hospital is the, the morbidity and mortality conference where people come together to share something. And it, usually it's something that went wrong and the person had a complication from a medicine or a surgery and you examine all of the things that led to that and, mm -hmm. and, and with the team that's going to be doing these things in the future. And M&M &M conference is really a good application of learning 
it can be very complex to init initiate in settings, especially settings where you have a very strong honor shame kind of culture, because it requires a level of transparency and honesty, as well as a, a real recognition of of blame being you know, not assigning blame, but understanding that this is a system that's leading to that. And so within clinical services, I would say, you know, some way of creating these feedback loops in a setting that's safe and non-judgmental. Uh, and uh, definitely in my training, I was in an M&M conference was where people got grilled for the mistakes that they made. But the ideal way is to create a safe environment, to create honesty about, what things went wrong and why they went wrong so that you can fix those. And non, I, I saw from Deborah, Deborah Shout, uh, lessons learned from non-Western cultures. And, and actually, I think in some ways, um, my, my context is primarily in Africa, but I think there is an understanding that sometimes we need to learn from uh, about their systems. What are these complex uh, systems that maybe are less obvious to us as Westerners about what happens within a community. Um, and I definitely have learned that if you don't get a buy-in from the traditional leaders of a community, you're not going to be able to implement a community-based program. On the other hand, if you have the buy-in, and, and especially if you are responding to something they have identified as a priority for them, uh, and you get a huge buy-in from traditional leaders and from, I would say, the women in the community who are, often do the work, you know, you can have amazing results with very little resources in, so, in a lot of, lot of situations. So really understanding the complex uh, environment, you have a mission hospital that's operating right within communities. And so really understanding the dynamics of that community, and then also including people. We talk about you know these stakeholder engagements and having having representation from the community, uh, and, and this is part of why it's so important to have a member of that community be a part of mapping systems and understanding what are the the responses that we can have as a system to fix this problem, whatever it is in our community. Thank you. Is there a, 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 just a, a note to people, if you've got questions, please put them into the Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of the screen, not chat. A lot of people are putting them in the, in the wrong place, which means they won't be picked up. Uh, is there a relationship, Perry, between the size of the organization and its uh, efficacy or capacity for systems thinking, or, or perhaps even the need of systems thinking? Is it is it a, as the organization gets bigger and bigger and more complex that you need more to approach things from this perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you think about these uh, sort of what we would call lean startups where everyone is is kind of very early on and many of them have like a huge uh, buy-in to the vision. They're part of creating this vision. They're excited about making this happen. They have a small team that can meet every day and it's a lot easier actually to, to, to do that when you have a small group that's highly motivated. As an organization grows, and I certainly saw this, you have people who are hired that come, this is just a job. And I, it's like, I, I saw, I think I saw the vision statement on the wall somewhere, but I don't know what it is, you know, that they don't really own that vision. And, and that's where I think, you know, adaptive leadership is really about trying to make sure that each person from your cleaner to your CEO really knows what the vision is of the organization and why it is that they're doing what they're doing. Uh, you know, that, that classic story of the cleaner at NASA cleaning the toilet saying, hey, I'm, I'm part of a team that's sending a man to the moon, that recognition of that connection. Yeah. How, does, how does one become an adaptive leader? What, 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 are, <laughs> what are the things that we, need to recognize given 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 how essential adaptive leaders are working in these sorts of situations some point in some ways it's sort of unlearning maybe some things that you think about what leaders are you know and often in context i've seen you know the leaders 
are the boss and you do what the boss tells you. And, and, I, and I certainly see this in, in all cultures, but certainly in Africa, there's this tradition of, you know, we've got the, we've got the, the colonialism that has happened, but you also have the chief uh, phenomena where you do whatever the chief tells you to do. Mm-hmm. And, and those, are, those are cultures that we have to recognize that we work within. But also as, as a leader to, to really recognize that you can be your, your best leader by supporting and empowering those people who are directly under you and creating an organizational culture that respects others and thinks together and becomes what we would call a learning organization. So uh, an organization that, that really values feedback and responsive changes. Um, and so adaptive leadership, you know, I, there's a, there's a bunch of books, there's a, the, but the best, probably the best way to learn how to be an adaptive leader is to, is to look for uh, adaptive leaders <laughs> and, and let them be your mentors and your models uh, to try and find someone that you can emulate rather than just uh, reading a book and trying it yourself. Um, uh, Coaching uh, can often be very helpful as a part of this project pr- uh, process, but I, I think finding a mentor for those who can uh, is difficult sometimes in settings, and it's difficult to have the time to connect with the mentor. Um, but that's often how these are learned is is through mentoring. And some of the most impactful leaders have impacted the world not just through their own actions, but through the people that came up alongside them that they that they influenced. Yes, and I, I guess uh, one thing about an adaptive leader is that they recognize their own limitations as well. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, uh, resist the temptation to control the situation, but rather recognize those who are who have got the gifts and insights to help at every given step of the process and empower them to work alongside yeah. you as a team. Uh, the, the picture of the of the starlings is is a beautiful one, isn't it? And And yeah. yet that complex beauty is the product of some very simple rules as you as you uh as you illustrated to us yeah so uh we've sadly just about run out of time i've just got uh one last question here but what are what are some simple ways of helping people who are used to linear thinking to think about systems i mean you've helped us today with this overview of the of the principles but um, you know, people going away, scratching their heads, thinking, look, uh, Perry's really onto something here that I haven't really taken on board. How can yeah. I, I, how can I think more in this systems way? I think one thing would be to, if you have a specific issue that you're dealing with, to try to bring people together with maybe a, a piece of paper or a whiteboard and just map out all of the things that are contributing to this problem that you have and what are some ways that you can positively impact and start you know this very simple causal loop diagram to say well if we did this what impact would it have on that and start mapping a- as a team uh those things and what you'll realize is that that your team members will bring up things that you really hadn't thought of and and didn't know um and and you'll come up with and then, then focus on what are some of the things that are out of our control? What are some things that could be potential leverage points? And, and often when you do this as a team, you'll come up with some ideas of really how this whole system works. But more than that, you're creating a shared mental model of what the problem is, what the contributors are, what we can do to address this. And that then impacts their their actions as they as they go back their their daily jobs trying to deal with this problem. Perry, thanks so much for uh, opening the subject up to us and and uh, giving us something to savor and look forward to, to knowing more about as well. And if you've been listening today, you'll be pleased to know that today's session has been recorded and it will be available on our website in the next 48 hours or so. And if you've booked for the session, then we'll be writing to you with a link to that and also uh, some links to other resources as well. Some of the things that Perry has mentioned as we've gone through the lecture uh, as well. So uh, and, and thanks, too, for your 
allusions to the body of Christ. Uh, systems thinking is mm. is biblical. God didn't call one man to lead everything, but uh, people with diverse gifts and personalities and experiences in a body together. And I guess that's a big part of ICMBA is that we're talking not just about the church in one country, but uh, being participants across the whole world and finding solutions for the challenges that we face together. So thank you very much, Perry. Thank you thank too. You. And we look forward to seeing you soon on ICMBA webinars. May the Lord bless you.